Good morning again. Take your Bible if you have it and open it to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, once again. Now, if you were here last week, I trust you recall that the question was posed, what do you think of Jesus? Who do you think he is? Interesting, on this past Friday, just a couple days ago, uh, the results of a new survey conducted by Lifeway Research, it was released by, I think it's called Ligon Year Ministries, revealed that 52% of Americans, including 30% of evangelicals, say they believe that Jesus Christ was a good teacher and not God. Ugh. Another part of the survey, 65% of the evangelicals agreed that, with the statement, Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. Good grief. It's not good. In fact, Stephen Nichols, the chief academic officer of this ministry, said this, as the culture around us increasingly abandons its moral compass, Professing evangelicals are sadly drifting away from God's absolute standard in Scripture. It's clear that the church does not have the luxury of idly standing by. This is a time for Christians to study Scripture diligently, engage confidently with people in our culture, and witness fearlessly to the identity and saving work of Jesus Christ in the gospel. Well, I don't know if I could agree any more wholeheartedly. The challenges facing True Christianity are mounting, they're increasing, they're waxing worse and worse. All the more reason for you as an individual to know what you believe and why you believe it, and then be willing to share that with others as God would, would lead. You know, so you think of the question, who is Jesus? Again, Jesus is the one who posed this question. He did it in two ways. You can see in verse 13 here, Matthew 16, he said, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, Well, who do you say that I am? And Simon, Simon Peter answered and said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so he first asked his disciples who the masses that they'd been ministering to all these months and years thought he was. And then... Well, you know, I, I like the fact that they were aware of what other people thought of Jesus. They weren't, you know, just lollygagging along. They were interacting. They were, you know, perceiving the pulse of the people around them. That was very good. What I'm really encouraged about, and Peter answered for the group here again, and said this, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That encourages me. You know, it's crucial to understand who Jesus is. And it's crucial to understand why it matters. And that's where a lot of Christians are lacking discernment in this day and age. I mean, people have been questioning the true identity of Jesus since before he was born, right up until now. But Peter called him the son of the living God, a term that he acknowledged that Jesus was God, and not only was God, but was God manifested in the flesh. And this is consistent with what Jesus came to do. We read in John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one, Jesus, who he himself is God, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. That's why Jesus came, to declare him to us. He did so when he walked on earth, and he did so consummately when he went to the cross of Calvary. And though Peter mentions this, we're going to see here in a minute, he needed more instruction. His knowledge was weak. Even some of the other disciples didn't catch on to who Jesus was completely even after all the time they spent with him. In the upper room discourse on the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus said to this to his disciples, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe on the count of the works themselves. He said this, right? But I should have included the previous verse. You've been with me so long, you don't get this yet? But Jesus knows who he's dealing with and you and I fit the bill. But why does it matter? What difference does it make? See, the reality is that if Jesus wasn't God, we'd still be in our sins, because only God could perform an acceptable sacrifice 
for sins that would fully cancel them. Jesus had to be God. If Jesus was merely a man, his sacrifice would have been just another death at the hands of the Roman authorities. But I like how Hebrews puts it here. In reference to Christ, it says, who being the brightness of his glory. Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. He's the express image of his person, not obviously physically, but in character. And upholding all things by the word of his power when he had noticed by himself, and this is so important to understand, by himself, purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. By himself, in order for God to do that, or Jesus to do that, he had to be a man because God can't die, he's eternal life, but Jesus can die. This is why Hebrews 10, 12 says this, and every priest stood ministering daily, and when this was written, they were still doing it in Jerusalem. They repeated the same sacrifices, and what could they do? They could never take away sins. Just like all the good works in the world aren't going to take away your sins. But this man, Jesus Christ, notice he was a man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God because the work was done. And so Jesus had to be God. He had to be blameless. He had to be sinless. And that's important. That's extremely important. He claimed to be God in the flesh, and his death on the cross would mean something totally different if that wasn't the truth. That because he was a perfect man, he suffered God's wrath. Notice in your place. And understanding the gospel means you need to understand substitution. You need to understand what took place there and that you were the object of his work. He was dying in your place. See, sins deserve punishment. The question you need to answer for yourself, who does God punish for your sins? You or Jesus. Now, God did punish Jesus for all of our sins, but the issue that you face is, are you going to accept his payment or not? Because then, if not, you're going to be relegated to a lake of fire because you didn't accept the payment that someone made for you. You said no. The reality is, is that Jesus paid it all, like the song says, all to him I owe. And this is why he came. Notice, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him, he came as a savior. And the issue is, will you accept it? Will you believe? Whoever, it's open to anybody. And the issue is believes. That means put your confidence in, your trust in, your faith in. If you believe in him, there's only one right object of your faith. It's not him plus anything else. It's Christ alone. If you do that, the Bible authoritatively authoritatively says you are not condemned. But notice, same whoever does not believe. Everyone has to make a choice about Christ. You're already condemned. You were born condemned. You are born in Adam. You are born sinner. You are born separated from God. And there's nothing you can do to get sep or unseparated from him and reconnected to him. Christ has to do it. And the reason you're separated and the reason you're going to be condemned is because you haven't made a choice to believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's it. So important. So, so important. And so either an individual accepts the complete sacrifice made by Christ and he rose from the grave, he lives forevermore, he proved that God accepted his payment and you accept him or you bear the consequences. And sadly, that's what's going on in the world today and the stakes can't be higher. I like what Spurgeon said. I read a Spurgeon quote this week. He said, this is why eternal security is true. If God punished Christ for your sin, he will never punish you. That's the beauty of the gospel. Payment, God's justice cannot demand first at the bleeding surety's hand and then again at mine. The justice that God demanded was paid for completely by Christ. The decision you face is, will you accept it for yourself? And so Jesus asked the question to the disciples. Peter, speaking for the group, answered beautifully. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And notice what Jesus says in verse 17. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And we saw last time that Jesus responds to Peter by calling him blessed, blessed. Why? Because he had a heart that was willing to allow the Spirit of God to take the written Word of God and speak to him and bring him the truth that set him free. And that's really the, the thread that runs through the Gospel accounts. We're going to see it even again today. 
And from Christ's perspective, this is worthy of calling you blessed because nothing thrills him more than to watch a soul set free by the truth. That's true in salvation. That's true in our walk with him. But Jesus used this confession as a starting point to explain his future ministry, verse 18. And I say also to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Spent some time last week trying to discern what these things are saying. But Jesus, first of all, declares that he will build his church. This is the first mention. It's future tense. The church started on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God came down and Peter preached. And one of the unique features of being part of the church is that you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You're in Christ, which is unique to this dispensation. And your Savior's going to come again and receive you onto himself, and that could be today. And there's many other things. But it's a group of called out ones that have put their faith in Christ. And he says, I'm going to build this church, and I'm going to build it on this rock. And so this is a play on words in the Greek, and this is important to know. He says, you're Peter. Peter, you're a small rock or a stone. But on this rock, something different than Peter, it refers to Christ because the word means large rock. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And so there's been a lot of discussion about what this rock means. The conclusion that I put forth last week was when he said Petros, he said it in contrast to Petra. And I think Petra, this rock in this context is the Peter's confession of faith. And what is this confession of, confession of faith? You're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. That's what Jesus built his church upon. And everyone becomes part of the church when they put their faith in that confession. When they equate, uh, when they say the same thing Peter does in their heart and they're trusting Christ as their Savior. That was my conclusion, if you recall from last week. And this is consistent with other things we read. Now, it's not that the apostles and prophets weren't part, and this is New Testament prophets, by the way, weren't part of the building process. But the foundation or the chief cornerstone is who? Jesus. And so doctrinally, from a doctrinal perspective, the church was built on the teaching of the apostles and prophets. That's what we have recorded for us in our New Testament. That teaching. That was part of the building in terms of the doctrinal understanding of what the church is. But there's only one foundation. Jesus is building the church upon himself. And we saw this in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 11. Paul says, for the grace that has been given to me, I laid a foundation. Now, the foundation is the gospel. When you preach the gospel, that's the foundation. As an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. And this is in reference to the teachers that were at Corinth who were teaching the word of God, and the church is being built up from an edification standpoint. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any other foundation than is laid, which is what? Jesus Christ. There's only one foundation. It's built on Jesus Christ. He builds his church through the teaching of the word of God and through the preaching of the word of God. And the church grows numerically and, in term, and spiritually as that word of God is taken in and received and applied. And so that's really the idea here. But Jesus also made a promise regarding the durability of the church. The promise regarding the durability of the church is that the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. That's what he says in the second half of verse 18. Now remember, Hades is equivalent to the Old Testament word Sheol. They're identical, same words, different language. One's Greek, the other's Hebrew. But it refers to the realm of the dead. Now again, Bible scholars have debated the actual meaning of this phrase, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Some feel it's in reference to the powers from Hades, an allusion to Satan though he is fierce and ferocious and he's looking for someone to devour, the idea here is that whatever he does, he's not going to prevail against the church. And that is certainly a true statement. And they say this because the protection of a city was determined by the strength of its gates. But he's not talking about the gates of the church, he's talking about gates of heaven. It's not like 
you know, it doesn't say you're going to prevail against the gates of the church here. It says the gates of Hades won't prevail against it. And I think what this alludes to is that Jesus said here in verse 21, just a couple verses, three verses later, he talks about his death. And so I think he's saying the church is going to be established in spite of the powers of Hades of hell, which means death. Death is not going to stop the church. It's not going to stop the church at all. Again, it's been often interpreted representing the evil forces of Satan attacking the church. But since it refers to the abode of the dead, not to eternal hell, the church will never fail is the idea here. Though generation after generation succumbs to the power of physical death, other generations will rise up to perpetuate the church. It's been going on now for almost 2,000 years, and it's going to continue until the Lord says it's time. The rapture happens, and then the rest of God's program will then ensue. But notice, this is consistent with what Jesus said to his disciples after his resurrection. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And notice, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He's never going to leave us or forsake us. Christ is in us, the hope of glory. And so that means the church is going to prevail because Christ is here till the end of the age. But Jesus also told Peter that he was going to give him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven always speaks of the earthly kingdom. And the church is going to be part of the earthly kingdom. And so the question is, how do you get into the kingdom? When you think of the term keys, keys are used or symbolic for authority. They're also symbolic of what you keep in and what you keep out. And so the keys of the kingdom have everything to do with you being part of the church or part of the kingdom, which has everything to do with the forgiveness of sins. And so this is speaking of the forgiveness of sins. The key to this is the gospel. And what's helpful is to see this in the New American Standard Version. He says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bond on earth, notice, shall have been bound, perfect tense in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. And so he's not declaring something that isn't already established. What's already been established, however, is whether someone's saved or not. From the standpoint, if you accept Christ as your Savior, I can say, based on the authority of Scripture, your sins are forgiven. You're entering in. Because it's already been established in the heavens that whoever trusts Christ as their Savior is going to go to heaven. This is why, after the resurrection, Christ said this. He breathed on them instead of receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Well, what kind of authority is that? No man has the authority in and of themselves to make that statement. The authority is delegated from the standpoint, do you believe the gospel or not? If you believe the gospel, I can say, I have the authority to say your sins are forgiven. That was true of the apostles. That's true of everybody. If you don't, I have the authority to say, guess what? Your sins are not forgiven. And you're on the highway to hell. And you better trust Christ as your Savior and have that situation changed. And so the keys to the kingdom is really done through the pro proclamation of the gospel. And that brings us to verse 20. Jesus then commands his disciples not to tell anyone that he is the Christ. They should tell no one that he is the Christ. It's to remain secret at this stage of his ministry because the nation was not prepared to understand it properly. And secondly, his work was not yet done. It wasn't finished. See, the trouble with the nation at this time is their idea of a Messiah was connected to extravagant political ideas. They expected to be delivered physically from the oppression and politically from the oppression of the Romans and so forth. Now there's a day coming when Christ will set up his kingdom on earth and the nation and the people that are saved will be free from that oppression. 
But this was not the time. And throughout history, there's always been oppressors and the oppressed. And that's not going to change. And we live in a day and age where people think that's their biggest problem. You know what? That's not their biggest problem. Their biggest problem is that they're sinners that need to be saved. And sometimes the oppression of life is what causes people to see their need of, the, of a Savior. But to further explain why they shouldn't tell anyone comes in verse 21. From that time forward, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed, and then be raised the third day. So Jesus begins to explain the basis of how he would build his church and fulfill his Messiahship. Takes advantage of this time after their confession of who he is to let him know this is my program. Now it's interesting, that phrase from that time indicates a mark, should be a mark, or indicates a marked, should be marked change, not a, there's an additional A there, in Jesus' ministry. This is a wholesale shift in his ministry. In fact, that same phrase was used in Matthew 4, 17, at the beginning of his ministry. After he was baptized, and the Spirit of God came upon him. Matthew 4, 17 says, From that time Jesus began to preach, and this was the message he began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Well, Christ has been rejected now. That was all part of what he understood would come. And so there's a shift here. He's no longer preaching the kingdom of heaven is, is here. He's going to start to preach the church is coming. Important to recognize. There's a new phase of his ministry is about to begin. So Jesus is beginning to point out to his disciples more plainly and more clearly than ever before why he needs to do what he needs to do. They needed to understand that there was redemptive work that needed to be completed. Now, he spoke in a veiled way about his death before. He did so in Matthew 12. He did so in Matthew 16 earlier, even 16, 4. And he's going to tell him several more times before this happens on the road to Jerusalem. Well, it's interesting here, though, is he's pretty emphatic because he uses the word must. At that time, Jesus began to show his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem. And the word must there implies a constraint and imperative, a divine necessity. This is not optional. This is something he absolutely has to do. And this is why he came into the world. In fact, according to verse 21, there are four things that have to happen. He must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer. He must be killed. And he must be raised on the third day. Those are absolute things that have to be done. And again, this is why he came. We saw Hebrews 10, 7. Then I said, I, lo, I come, and the volume of the book that is written to me. This is what scriptures say for me from beginning to end. I've come to do thy will, O God. And his will was a cross. The cross of Calvary. He has to go to Jerusalem. Now, he's really been avoiding Jerusalem. He's only gone for the feasts a few times through Jerusalem. He spent all his time up in Galilee, and for the last part of his ministry, he's been traveling around in Gentile areas, and he's up in a Gentile area right now because the heat is on. The Pharisees want to kill him again and again. In fact, we saw in 51 that the, the religious leaders from Jerusalem traveled up to Galilee, and they confronted him after he came out of Dec Decapolis, and he said, we demand a sign from you. And he said, you're not going to get one. And he took off from there. But he has to go to Jerusalem. I'm sure the disciples are thinking, well, why go there? How could it possibly further your work by going there? Because they know that 
These guys want to kill him. The Pharisees want to kill him. But he gives us an answer in Luke 13, 33. Christ said, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. He has to go to Jerusalem. It's all part of the fulfillment of Scripture. And there Christ was going to be officially executed. In fact, when he says suffering here, he's very specific in verse 21. Suffer many things from the people. No, he gets real specific. Suffer many things from the elders, the chief priest, and the scribes. The religious leaders of the nation. This is a word for the Sanhedrin, the ruling body. They would do tribunals for the Jews. And I'm sure this is hard for the disciples to hear. It says, suffer many things. But these three groups represented what should have been the best in Israel. They were designed to lead the nation religiously and politically, and they should have been the ones leading the charge, saying, let's embrace Jesus of Nazareth as our Messiah. But they were the exact opposite. And then it says, be killed. Now, be killed there is not a word for lawful execution. It's actually a word you could use in murdering someone. And Christ was murdered. It's a Greek word, opok, apoktino. And I see I didn't put a slide here, but it's going to. But it, says, it means to kill in any way whatever, to destroy or allow to perish, to inflict mortal death. You know, Jesus was not going to be legally tried or proved guilty of any sin. He was illegally murdered. And don't lose sight of that. He's going to be sentenced to death on the basis of false charges, false witnesses, a governor more interested in political expediency instead of knowing what the truth is. And in fact, I think he knew what the truth is. He just, truth didn't matter to him. And Peter mentions this when he's preaching the gospel in Acts 2. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God had this all worked out, but that doesn't mean mankind is not culpable. You crucified, and notice, you killed by the hands of lawless men. They were responsible. Though God allowed it and God predicted it and God said this has to come to pass, mankind was responsible, especially the religious leaders. They just confessed him as Christ, the son of the living God, and now he's telling him, I'm going to be killed. I'm sure their heads are going, what is going on here? But then he finished with good news. I'm going to be raised the third day. That should have made everything else go away. But Peter in particular wasn't listening very well, was he? Verse 22. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. So Peter takes Jesus aside and begins to rebuke him. Peter's having an emotional reaction here. He probably couldn't believe his ears. This did not fit at all with what he thought the Messiah, who he just confessed, was going to do. He said, this ain't, this isn't the Messiah I know. Now, the proper way to take someone, to rebuke someone is to take them aside. We can give them credit there, right? But this is a strong word for rebuke. The Greek word is epitima, o, and it's to rate, chide, rebuke, rebuke, censure severely, punish someone. It's like getting in someone's face and saying, no way, Jack. This is what you'd say to punish someone. It suggests a person who comes powerfully at another to show him that he's wrong. <laughs> Let me straighten you out here, Jesus. In fact, that rebuke carries the idea of authoritative judgment. He said, far be it from you, Lord. God forbid it. In fact, the word Lord rings kind of hollow there, doesn't it? If he's the Lord, doesn't he decide what should be done? But he strengthens it by saying, this will never happen to you. 
See, Peter couldn't understand in his own mind how this could all possibly happen. And Peter found it offensive that the Messiah, who came to deliver him and the Jews, would actually be killed. It just doesn't add up to him. So I can't let this happen. What he was really saying is, I don't want this to happen. I don't want you to suffer and die. But Peter was thinking about his own self-interest. Now, I'll give him some credit. I, I think he was trying to do in his mind, his mind what he thought was the right thing. But he missed something here. What did Peter miss? Well, first of all, he should have thought back to the beginning of Christ's ministry, and what he missed is what John the Baptist said about Christ at the very beginning of the ministry. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If he was listening and thinking, he would have recognized this is all part of the plan. But his mind brushed aside the thought of Messiah as God's son. He says, you're God's son. You're the son of the living God. Why don't you just stretch out your hand and, and establish the kingdom? This is his mindset here. But you know, to this day, all who fail to see the horrible reality of sin are blind to this true necessity of the cross. You know, people day and age, if they even think this at all, think that Christ just died a noble martyrdom-type death for a cause. This is why most folks think that good people go to heaven, and they're one of them. The cross means nothing to them. You know, I can't tell you how many times in the surveys, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of surveys I've given over the years, that those who think they have a 60% chance or better of going to heaven, so many of them don't even mention Jesus Christ. The question is, why would God let you into heaven? Well, I haven't killed anybody. I'm a fairly good guy. I, I do this. They, list their, uh, they give me a list of their accomplishments or the list of things they haven't done. Jesus Christ isn't even part of the answer. His work on the cross isn't even mentioned. Amazing. Peter's thinking the same way right now. What else did he miss? Whoops. He missed the resurrection. He just told him he was going to raise from the dead. Right? They should have understood that his death wasn't going to be the end of it all. And it wouldn't hinder in any way the prediction that Jesus made regarding even his church and the keys to the kingdom and so forth. He just said, I'm going to arise. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I'm going to rise from the dead, Peter. Well, he just couldn't seem to get past the fact that Jesus was going to suffer and die. Which means he wasn't listening. And I couldn't help but think this week, how much do I miss when I don't listen to God's word carefully? And this verse came to mind, John 8. Jesus said to those who believed on him, and this is critical, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But you have to what? Abide in my word, which means you have to listen. You have to think. You have to make it your own. And what will that truth do? It'll set you free. What did Peter not do? So we can say the opposite is true. You don't listen carefully to the word of God. Instead of welcoming that word of God with humility and open arms and allowing it to minister to you, you're going to get thrown for a loop. Peter did not listen. Peter had an emotional response, a very strong one, to the truth. He did not like. He didn't like what it had to say. And when you don't like what the truth has to say and you have an emotional reaction to it, you're in the same kind of miserable bondage that Peter's in right here. Peter's in miserable bondage because he didn't listen to what Christ had to say. He wanted to change God's plan. And when you're carnal, you'll think the same thing. God, I'm not listening. I want you to hear me. I want you to change your plan for me. Thank you. You know, how do you respond when God allows some negative news in your life? Or God states something in his word that's contrary to how you think and how you think he should act. 
He allows your life to take a turn that you, by nature, abhor in some way. Instead of saying, you know what, Lord, thank you for this because you do all things well, mentally perhaps, or maybe verbally like Peter here, you rebuke God. How can you let this happen to me? You know, Peter's a living example of how allowing my thoughts of how I think should be invalidate the clear teaching of Scripture. Peter had an idea, and that idea flew right in the face of Scripture, and it made him miserable. Now, before we criticize him too much, we recognize that Peter means well in his own mind. He's got a close personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves him. They love each other. And it's not uncommon. I mean, when you hear someone you love is going to die, you usually don't respond well initially, right? I mean, you don't want that to happen. So an emotional response is not necessarily out of the ordinary here. But is it helpful? And the answer is no. In fact, it's wrong. I mean, they were friends. You don't want it to happen. But your natural response to unwelcome news is usually never helpful. I mean, I'm sure you figured out, I mean, if you're ever watching a Viking game, you know exactly what that's like, right? Chip shot, Blair Walsh, right? Misses it to the left. Why do I still remember that? Someone cuts you off in the freeway. What's your first response? Oh, have a nice day. <laughs> Usually your emotional response to, you know, dropping a glass, whatever it might be, isn't the best. And that's what Peter's doing here. You know, it's just as wrong when you see news that you hear that so-and-so has cancer or whatever unwelcome news you might really not want to hear. Now, was Peter wrong for not wanting Jesus to die? And the answer is absolutely yes. Because it's against the will of God. See, this is why you cannot be driven emotionally in the face of your difficulty. You need to be driven principally from the word of God. See, the emotional response ignored the revealed will of God. And it, I think it's pretty safe to say that most of us get in trouble right there. You know, there's plenty of times when the right thing to do before the Lord is emotionally troubling. But it's still the right thing to do, and it needs to be done by faith, believing that Jesus does all things well. I mean, Jesus had to do this on his own. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was emotionally troubled. He was sweating as it were drops of blood, and yet he kept repeatedly saying, what? Not my will be done, thy will be done, even though this is something I really don't want to do. I really don't want to face. And frankly, the most unstable souls on the planet, and I'm talking about those that are saved, are those who emotionally respond to things they don't like. They don't allow the truth to stabilize their soul and direct their path. I think this would have been a good time for Peter to go to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. He knew the verse. It was part of the scriptures, right? Trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, Peter. In all your ways... Submit to him, and he'll make your path straight. He'll make it clear. He'll direct. So you and I get in trouble when, in our Christian lives, we want something on our terms. Peter wanted Jesus to be the Messiah on his terms and not Jesus' terms. And by nature, you do too. You want Jesus to be the Messiah that gives you an easy life, however you define it. You want be Jesus to be the Messiah that doesn't allow you to suffer or deal with grief or wrongdoing, to make an easy path for you. Now again, I'm not saying Peter doesn't love Jesus because I know he does. But any human concern that does not line up with the concerns of God, by default line up with the concerns of Satan. You ever looked at it that way? That's how Jesus looks at it. If what you want doesn't agree with God's agenda, it agrees with Satan's agenda. 
That's Jesus' next point here. Verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Whoa. You know, it's interesting. Verse 22 says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke. He didn't even get finished. Jesus didn't wait. He never paused to ask Peter, why are you thinking this? He just turns right now and boom, gives it to him straight. This is one instance, and we've all been here, where you can go from being blessed by God to be rebuked by God in a matter of minutes. He just blessed him up there in verse 17. And now he's chewing him out royally in verse 22. Or 23, rather. I was reminded when I thought about this that right after a spiritual victory, I am ripe for failure. A few seconds ago, Peter's rejoicing in some divine revelation, and the next, he's a mouthpiece for Satan. So Jesus strongly rebukes Peter here. This is a strong rebuke. And the first thing he does is he faces Peter squarely and tells him to get behind him. That's what the idea there in verse 23 is. The phrase means, get out of my sight. Ouch. Make it better, calls him Satan. <laughs> oh. Now don't be thinking about your spouse. How lovely to be called Satan. I mean, granted, Peter's misunderstanding Jesus' mission here, but to be called Satan? I mean, is that reasonable, Lord? And the answer is yes. Unwittingly, and though moved by the best intentions, Peter made himself an agent of Satan. What a warning to be on guard. Even in our own love for others. Even in our best intentions for others. Because unwittingly, we might be contributing to the work of Satan and not of God. But what Jesus says here to Peter parallels what Jesus himself said to Satan when he was tempted. You know, Satan offered Jesus an instant kingship, instant messianic rule. He was told he could have all the kingdoms of the world without ever having to go to the cross. This happened at the beginning of Christ's ministry. Again, the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. Get out of my sight, Satan. Says the same thing to Peter. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. That's always how Satan is. Skip the hardship, man. Take the easy road. Grab the glory now. Satan's all about falsehoods and false promises. He's saying, compromise the truth for your own benefit. Anybody here think like that? We all do. He's saying, make it about you and not the Lord. That's the perpetual message of Satan. You play God. Don't let God be God. You play God. You know, Satan has sought since Christ's birth. He tried to prevent Christ's birth, but since he tries to several times to have Christ die a premature death. He used Herod's killing of the babies outside of Bethlehem. A lot of biblical scholars think that that waves where Peter had to wake up and say, don't you care that we're dying, that Satan was trying to kill him there. And now he's working through Jesus' closest friend on earth to do the same thing, thwart the plan of God. Satan offered Christ a throne without a cross. Peter is doing the same thing as an agent of Satan. See, Peter says, what do we need to do this for? Why don't you just take the throne now? He was obviously oblivious 
to the prophetic scriptures because in Isaiah 53, 12, for reference to Christ, he poured out his life unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. These things had to be fulfilled. Peter was actually an agent of Satan and not wanting scripture fulfilled. And we read in Hebrews, for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Isn't that amazing? That's you and me. This is why, again, Jesus probably told his disciples not to tell anyone. Because they, again, anticipated a Messiah that would usher in God's victory and would release them from the oppression of the Romans and what have you. Undoubtedly, the message would have been twisted and gotten wrong, and Jesus kept saying, I don't want you to say anything. But, you know, there's another reason why Jesus had to go through that suffering. You know, he had to be touched by all of it. You know, it says in Hebrews 4 that we can come boldly to a throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help in time of need because we don't have a high priest that has not been touched by every one of our infirmities and weaknesses and problems and pain. You know, if he was going to understand and be the perfect empathizer with you and me and all mankind, he had to go through it all. How could he enter into the pain of the world and share it vicariously? How could he root the evil of, of the world, which lies well below the pain and the death, apart from his suffering? How could he fix everything if he didn't feel everything and die for everything? See, only by taking upon himself the assaults of evil and allowing those things to crush him at the Father's bidding and be raised anew could he fulfill all the things that await for us by grace. No shortcut for Jesus. This is the program God ordained for him. So Jesus says, you get out of here, Peter. And he calls him Satan. Whoa. You know, keep in mind that Peter is us. I hope you know that. And you know, you might think, well, Jesus is talking kind of harsh to Peter. But Jesus' love for Peter hasn't diminished in any way. You think Peter loves, excuse me, Jesus loves Peter less than he did five minutes ago when he said, blessed are you, Simon Barjoni? No, absolutely not. In fact, he called him a rock because he knew by the grace of God and what the Spirit of God would do to make him when the church would begin 40 days after his resurrection. He knows our weaknesses, our misunderstandings, our failures. It never stops him from loving us. Isn't that encouraging? He cares for us, which means he seeks to correct us, and that even means rebuke us, but it's all done in love. And to realize that as a pastor sometimes, I'm to do the same. Paul told this to Timothy. Servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all able to teach patience and humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Now, sometimes being gentle and humility means a rebuke because Jesus was the perfect epitome of being gentle. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and they may come to, see the sense, come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Peter at this moment was taken captive by the devil to do the devil's will. And Jesus rebuked him because Jesus loved him and cared for him and wanted to restore him. And so don't go with this thing in the mind that Jesus never rebuked, and a rebuke is not, you know, inconsistent with love. It might be the very thing that is love. But Jesus went... Peter went from the friend to the villain in a second or two. But what else does Jesus say here? He says, you're an offense to me, verse 23. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. You're an offense to me. Now, this is, again, a very strong word. Scandalon. It was the trigger of a trap in which the bait is placed, and which, when touched by the animal, springs and causes to close, causing entrapment. 
He says, you're trying to trap me, Peter. Just like Satan, you're trying to trap me. It's no different than the people at the cross are going to say, if you're the son of God, come down and save yourself. You know, what Peter's doing here is the same mindset of a lot of unsaved religious folks. Doing the will of Jesus, doing the will of God for Jesus means a cross. I'm going to read something to you here. I have permission to do that. You know, the cross doesn't make sense to the natural man. It doesn't appeal to people. They don't want to hear they need that kind of a savior because it offends their sensibilities and their pride. You know, we've been praying for Gretchen, we're praying for her father. She made an arrangement for someone to come to witness to her father. And he wasn't open, unfortunately, and he's up in age and not in good health. But one of Gretchen's relatives, after the visit, sent Gretchen this, and she said it was okay for me to read this. Hi, Gretchen, hope all is well today. Frank, that's her dad here today told me about your last lunch. He loves to see you and spend time with you. He's a good person, believes in God, and has done much for everyone, even people he doesn't know. You don't have to try to save his soul. He will be in heaven. I'm only saying this because he loves to see you and loves you. Please don't push him away. God knows it. I love you. Please don't be mad for me saying but this, but I love him too. Peace. That's it right there. Cross is offensive. I'm good enough to go. It's hard for me to even read that. People want to make Jesus who they want him to be. What did I say last week? A teddy bear or I forgot what else. They wanted Jesus on their terms. No mention of Jesus in the text. You know, people say, we just want to replicate the morals of Jesus. We just want to live by the golden rule. We want Jesus to be the social justice warrior. You know, if that was the Jesus that people wanted to be, we'd all be in our sin and we'd be on the highway to hell. And you might want to define him on your own terms, even as a believer. You know, Jesus is going to explain next time here, this ties into discipleship. You know, if you're going to come after me, you're going to have to think the same way I do. You're going to have to say no to yourself. So Jesus turned sharply against Peter because he was setting a, a satanic trap in his words. And you know, the point here is making is that when you embrace human viewpoint, you're doing the same thing. That's how he offends the verse, right? Jesus tells Peter that his interests are not on the things of God, but the things of man. What you reflect is human viewpoint that doesn't want a, a savior that's going to have to die for them. And Jesus calls it the thoughts of men. You know, we tend to define how God should deliver us in terms of our own culturally conditioned wishful thinking. The battle we're always fighting is we want to make it about us instead of about Christ. I mean, I would venture to say the majority of our prayers are, God, how can you, uh, you know, do these things for me? Whatever those things are, right? We want to, him to conform to our thinking when he says it needs to be the other way around. You find yourself, find it difficult to yield yourself to the ways of God because you want life on your terms? Have you come to realize that you can be influenced as a believer in Christ and be used actually to promote the thinking of Satan? You can be unwittingly, as a believer in Christ, to a fellow believer, an agent of Satan. You know, I've heard where girls, and because of the world is so messed up, teenage girls are struggling with their sexual desires. And another believer will come along and say, well, that's okay, God understands. 
That's a satanic trap. It's okay for you to date girls. No, it's not. That's Satan talking. You know, God's not going to change his word for you. And if you keep wanting God to be conformed into your liking, you're hardening your heart as you go along. You know, when believers encourage other believers to get a divorce when there's no biblical grounds for it, you're an agent of Satan. You know, when you forgive, refuse to forgive a fellow believer for something, and you're an agent of Satan. In fact, it says that right in Ephesians. It says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. He's whispering in your punish the chump. Make him pay. Don't forgive him. And you're an agent of Satan. When you encourage someone to be bitter and to stick it to someone else, Satan's laughing at you as you do his bidding. You know, in this context here, it's a doctrinal issue. You know, when you do not stand on the gospel and directly say it's okay to embrace a false gospel or false responses to the gospel, you're doing the bidding of Satan. When you say to someone it's okay if you don't believe in eternal security, you're doing the bidding of Satan. When you insist on having your own way above God's, you become an offense and a stumbling block to Christ. It's to your own demise and to his dishonor. See, Peter was thinking in terms of the things of men. If he was thinking in terms of the things of God, he wouldn't have rebuked Christ. He would have encouraged him along the way. He would have encouraged him in the program and plan that God set forth through Jesus. But that's not where Peter's mind was at. He responded to his own emotions, his own desires, his own wisdom, and became an adversary to God's plan. Isn't that amazing? And we're subject to the same failure when we allow our emotions and desires to control us. You know, our wisdom is limited. It's easy for us to act like a child who only wants the candy and he wants it now, failing to see that that's the worst thing for him. Our Savior does all things well. See, this is what we call in the scripture a carnal mind. For those who live according to the flesh, that's your old sin nature, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded is death, it's a trap. To be spiritually minded, guess where life and peace is? It's in the will of God, it's not somewhere else. Why, the carnal mind is enmity against God. Was Peter's mind enmity against God right there? Absolutely, it's carnal mind. It's not subject to the law of God, nor can it be, and that's why you got the Spirit of God and a new nature when you got saved, and you yield yourself to the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to give you a divine viewpoint. See, when carnal, you make foolish decisions that alter the course of your life. They bring you troubles that you could never have imagined. They leave you broken spiritually in far worse shape than you were before. It's funny how a lot of believers think they could beat the system. And Jesus says, you know, you're not going to make a, God says, you're not going to make a fool out of me. I like what an old pastor from years ago, maybe a hundred said, to doubt the loving kindness of God is thought by some to be a very small sin. In fact, some have even exalted the doubts and fears of God's people into fruits and grace, evidences of great advancement and experience. It is humiliating to observe that certain ministers have pampered and petted men in unbelief and distrust of God, being in this matter false to their master and to the souls of his people. Far be it from me to smite the feeble of the flock, for their sins I must and will smite, since it is my firm conviction that to doubt the kindness and faithfulness and love of God is a very heinous offense. Now that guy's a pastor. You know, I'm out of time, but I have a number of things I wanted to say about a carnal mind today. I'll just give you a few. I'll just read them. I was going to comment on them. But. Listening to your deceitful heart causes you to draw the wrong conclusion about God's plan for you for others. Isn't that what happened here? 
The temptation to become and remain carnal is accentuated when we're in a prolonged trial. People think, well, when's it going to change for me? And Jesus is saying, when are you going to change? I'm here to change you. You want me to change this. I want to change you. Will you let me? No, I want it on my terms. Here's the scary part. Just because you got the result you desire doesn't mean God's in it. And that's why it brings a false sense of security. I think it's Proverbs 29 something. It says, when you're stiff neck and won't take correction, you get sudden destruction. You think everything's just, hey, hey, I got this baby licked. Boom. Carnality will cause you to become friends with the world. Your whole point of emphasis changes. Your whole value system begins to change. I've said this before, I just changed the word sin to carnality. It'll take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Not me, I'm special. Carnality should be cause you to start living a double life where you have to lie to cover your tracks. What a great way to live, isn't it? Always looking over your shoulder. Prolonged carnality can result in you endorsing and even fighting for the world's causes which stand in contrast to the word of God. I said that today because that is what's going on. There are carnal believers that are fighting for things that are a waste of time. And they wouldn't dare think about giving someone the gospel. But they'll be out on the front lines for a social cause. In the end, there's two things. When you look at verse 16, my admonishment is you could be like Peter. When you look at verse 22, don't be like Peter. <laughs> and let's recognize that we are where we are by the grace of God. Huh? Let's pray. Father, we're humbled again as we see that we're Peter. And by your grace, let's be Peter number one. Let's give you the praise and glory and attention and thought that you deserve. And let's, by your grace, not be Peter number two. Exalting the things of man and not the things of God and being an offense to you. But thank you that nothing can separate us from your love. Thank you that you want so much our spiritual success. You want us to walk in the blessings you procured for us in Christ. I pray that we'd have humble hearts. We'd be willing to allow you to direct in our thinking that we'd Take heed to ourselves, take heed to the word of God, and we'd listen to what the word of God says. Allow the spirit of God to make it real in our hearts and lives for your glory.